Right, it's good to see everybody today. Open your Bibles and with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, today I want to talk uh, about what makes a healthy church. Now next week I'm going to start a new sermon series through First and Second Chronicles, but I'm going to wait and, and we'll start that next Sunday morning. Uh, if you want to read the first nine chapters of Chronicles, that's what we're going to cover next week, you will be riveted, all right? It is nine chapters of genealogy, but I'll show you next week that those genealogies are very, very important and tell us about a lot of the great themes of Scripture. Scripture. And so if you like reading so-and-so begot so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so begot so-and-so and then he begot this guy and then they begot that guy and then they fought a battle and then they fought but had this guy, you're going to love next week, all right? But I promise you, I'll show you next week, it's an incredible section of, of Scripture. Today I want to talk about what makes a healthy church. Now if I was asked you to question what makes a good, solid church... Very often what I find is we, we judge by the wrong criterion. I can remember, especially as a young pastor, I would go off to conferences, I'd go and, and you know, they'd be having a conference over at so-and-so church and we'd go there and, and you'd say, man, this must be a great church. They've got thousands of people here. They've got a big orchestra. They've got a big choir. They've got this. They've got that. And that, that makes them a great church. Or that church is great because they have a, a television program and they have all of this that's going on. None of those things really define what a great church is. It's not about the building. It's not about the technology. It's really not even about the programs or especially the personalities. There are some biblical marks that make up what a healthy church looks like. And periodically, we need to be reminded about what this is. Now, today, we're going to be looking in Ephesians chapter 4. And Ephesians is one of my favorite books in all of the Bible. The church in Ephesus was planted by the Apostle Paul when he was on his second missionary journey. Now, you remember what we have in the book of Acts is we basically have a record of the spread of Christianity. And, and one of the main people that, uh, kind of the, uh, that God used in the midst of that was the Apostle Paul. And Paul by no means limited himself just to those three missionary journeys. We know from his epistles he had been preaching before he ever went out on that first journey. But we, we see in Acts these three major uh, journeys. And on each one, Paul China kind of changes his focus a little bit. On the first one, he planted a lot of churches in predominantly Jewish areas. He'd go into the synagogue, he'd preach in the synagogue, gather up a church and plant it. And very often, Tracy Suttles and I were talking about this just the other day. In a church like Thessalonica, he spent three weeks there. It took him three weeks to plant the church, <laughs> all right, and get it up and running. In Ephesus, it's very different. This is Gentile territory. Not a lot of Jews there in Ephesus. So Paul ended up spending three and a half years in that one place. Now, that doesn't sound like a long time. I've been here at, at First Baptist now for over a decade, almost a decade and a half. Cliff's been there longer than I have. And, and we think, man, they've been here a, a good while. Three and a half years, though, for Paul, that was a long time. That's the longest that we know of that he spent in any one single church. And Ephesus is an interesting place because if you wanted to pick a town and a culture that looks like America, Ephesus is the one you'd pick. It was the most American-like city that Paul ever preached in. What I mean by that is that, that, that Paul, uh, if you go there and you kind of look at what this town was like, uh, it, was, it was located in a place where it would attract a lot of travelers. So if you went to Ephesus, you would hear people from literally all over the Mediterranean world. Almost every language that you could imagine spoke in that part of the world, they were there in Ephesus. I remember a number of years ago being up in Chicago and, uh, and uh, we were in a part, they, they called it Uptown, all right? And, and Dennis Connor is one of the church planning strategists up there at the time. It was taking me around and showing me where we were doing a Southern Baptist different work in the city of Chicago. And we stood on a corner for a minute. He said, I want you to stop here just for one minute. And I just want you to listen and tell me what you do not hear. 
It was English. And Dennis, now I don't know how Dennis knew this. He might have been making it up because Dennis is from North Carolina and sometimes people from North Carolina make things up. But he told me that he could detect 13 different languages being spoken right there on that corner. That's the way Ephesus was. That's the way our culture is today. We are a multicultural country now. We've got people from all over the world, and you don't even have to go far um, to, to, to hear that. That's what Ephesus was like. It was a very modern city, a very cosmopolitan city. It, it was a place where people from all over have been drawn together, and it sort of developed this very unique kind of culture. It's interesting to me that one of church, Paul's most successful church plants happened in that culture. Don't tell me that this culture is opposed to the gospel or, or hardened to the gospel when Paul preached in almost the exact same setting and did some of his best work. But it took a while. Paul spent a number of years, three and a half years there in Ephesus, and then he'd been gone. And when he writes this letter, he's been gone about five or six years and he wants to write back to them, and he wants to talk to them about, he's in prison at this point in his ministry, and he wants to write back, and he wants to just, first of all, remind them of the blessings they have in Christ. This is one of the things that always amazes me. Paul's in prison, and what's he write about? First two and a half chapters of the book of Ephesus, or Ephesians rather, the book of Ephesus. The book of Ephesians is all about the blessings we have as a part of salvation. Read the first couple of chapters, and you'll see what I mean. Over and over again, he talks about the very fact that we've been saved, that God, before the foundation of the world, chose to send Jesus into the world to die for our sins and to redeem us. The very fact that before God ever even created, he had decided to save you. Paul had, he just goes down through and lists all of these incredible blessings, and then as he moves along, he begins to talk to the church about how to flourish in the midst of this culture. When he gets to chapter 4, notice what he says there. He says in the first 16 verses of this chapter, let's just read them together. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also descended into the lower regions. And, and let, me, let me just stop right there. And let's go back. And I, I want to pick some things up. And then we'll come back and we'll, we'll go through some more verses. The first thing I want you to notice in these first six verses is that a healthy church is marked by spiritual unity. Now listen to that. It is marked by spiritual unity. And Paul defines that spiritual unity in three different ways. He says, number one, here we are united in spiritual unity because we have a divine call. Did you notice what he says there in verse one? He talks there about being a prisoner of the Lord. He urges them to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. If you are a believer, you have been united together with every other believer in the world by a divine calling. Now, if you were to go back, as I said a few moments ago, and you'd look at this, Paul has been talking about this throughout the book. He had started this book off by reminding us and this is a mystery to a certain extent. I cannot fully, completely understand this. But, God's, but Paul says back in Ephesians, look, just look at it. Go back to Ephesians chapter 1. Look what he says here in, 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 in chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Paul says, listen, 
your salvation didn't start at the altar. It didn't start at the moment when you prayed to receive Christ. Your salvation started in the mind of God in eternity past when he made a choice. Now you say, preacher, I'm a little nervous about that. That sounds like predestination. You're right. (laughs) Now here's the bottom line is, I'm going to say this to you bluntly. I cannot fully understand, nor you can you fully understand, how God chose us before the foundation of the world, and yet we are free to choose him in our salvation. But the Bible teaches both of those truths. Now, sometimes it's wonderful when we're preaching, the, you know, the gospel and we're talking about evangelism. We want you to repent, put your faith and trust in Christ. But and after you come in, you begin to realize this incredible spiritual blessing that somehow before the foundation of the world, God had chosen every means of your salvation. If you go back and read Ephesians chapter 1, it talks about not only has he chosen us before the foundation of the world, but he predestined us for adoptions as son and daughters. He has redeemed us by his blood. He's given us an inheritance. What he's saying is by virtue of your salvation, you have been united as a divine, with a divine call. Every single believer has that call to salvation and to mission on their life. So Paul says, because of that, because of this divine call, you should walk in a manner worthy. You should conduct yourself in a way that reflects who you are. Amen? My dad, every once in a while, when I would be going out, you know, when I was a teenager, I was a Christian, but I'll be honest with you, I was backslidden most of my teenage years. Y'all know that? All right? Everybody does that sometimes, and I'm not justifying it. I'm not bragging about it. I'm just telling you that sometimes I'd be backslidden. My dad used to say something to me, and I don't know that I fully appreciated it when I was a teenager. But when I'd be leaving the house... He would say to me sometimes, remember who you are and whose you are. Now, that may not be good English, but what he was saying was, remember that you are a child of God. And I think he was also saying, remember, you're my son, and I will jack slap you if you get out of line. And he would. You get what I'm saying? But he was also reminding me of a spiritual. We need to know who we are. We are united together by a divine call. We are united together by Christ-like conduct. Look what he says in verse 2 and 3. He says, he says, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. And then he's going to define what that walk looks like. And this should define, if you want to say, well, what should the Christian life look like? What should it look like was it lived out by each and every one of us? Well, Paul gives us some words in verses 2 and 3 to describe it. He says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Look at the words there that he uses to describe. He says, this is what a worthy walk looks like. Now, I'm going to say to you very honestly that I think Christians have largely abandoned this. That very often what we think of as being a Christian isn't really reflected by these words. Notice what he says. He says, it should be reflected by humility. For unity to exist within the church and its members, we must be living for the good of other people. Humility means that we have a right estimation of who we are. We don't think of ourselves too highly. We don't think of ourselves too lowly. We have a right understanding of who we are. It is the opposite of self-exaltation and pride. Now, let me tell you why that's important. In our culture and in the culture in which Paul wrote in Ephesus, we, we like words like exalt yourself, pamper yourself, put your own needs first. We put self at the center of our universe very often, and that's the wrong place. Don't get me wrong, self is important. I'm not, I'm not denying 
that you taking care of you is an important part of your spiritual life at some moments. But I want to say this, if you think you're the center of the universe, you're wrong. God is the center of the universe and he needs to be the center of your universe. And so he reminds us that when we understand who we are, we understand that the only reason that we have hope at all is because Jesus saved us. It's so easy as Christians to forget this. We look down our nose, oh boy, that person's acting this way and that person's acting that way. And no, I would never act like that. Yeah, you would have. If you were lost, you'd act like that too. We need humility. He says another word here that we need. Uh, by the way, later on in, in, in Philippians, Paul says, another one of his favorite churches, Paul says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. He says, when you're a member of a church, you're trying to push the other person forward. You're trying to push the other person into leadership. You're trying to exalt the other person and, 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 and push them forward, not grab all of the spotlight for yourself. He says gentleness. Gentle does not mean being timid, but rather means being self-controlled. As believers, we're not marked by a sense of harshness. We're supposed not to bully each other into living right, but instead we are to be characterized by the same type of gentle spirit that pervaded Jesus. Now, could Jesus be strong? Yes. Could Jesus be bold? Yes. But he did that in a right and a proper way. We are to be patient. A lack of patient displays a lack of humility. Did you hear me what I said? When we lack patience, it's largely because we think we're the center of the world. And because people aren't serving and doing what we want to do, we get frustrated and then we get impatient and we get mad. We get impatient with God. When God doesn't do things on our time schedule, we get impatient. Why is that? Because we put our needs and we think we're more important than anything else that God has going on across the universe. Am I right? God's calling right now. <laughs> Saying, yes, absolutely. That's the problem. That's why we get impatient. It's not because I want what I want and I'm not getting fed. I'm not getting dealt with. I'm not getting taken care of. And so we need to learn patience. We need to bear and accept one another. This means, this means putting up with each other. It means, uh, you know, I, I've said this to you a thousand times. You're annoying to someone and I'm annoying to someone. The, the idea of bearing with each another is putting up with the people that sometimes irritate you, all right? And you can nudge whoever you want to sitting beside you. He, and he says that we need to diligently keep the, tr uh, keep the unity. So he reminds us we have a spiritual unity. I'm not going to get through this whole message. I just realized that. Um, we're not only united by a divine call and a Christ-like conduct, but we're united by a gospel confession. Look what he says in verses four through six. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Um, this is a place where most Bible scholars who have looked at this passage believe that Paul is actually quoting here a statement or a creed or a, 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 a statement of faith that was going around the church at the time. In other words, when the early church was trying to describe itself and, and explain who they were, that this was one of the, the phrases that they liked to use. And he's reminding us here that, that unity is developed around a common confession of a Christ. We talk to our new members class about the first and most important thing you've got to settle in order to be a member at First Baptist Church is your salvation. You got to know that you're saved. All right? You got to know that, that, that you're saved because you have placed your faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is the gospel. And you've come to know him. 
All right, that's the, that's the basis upon which all of this is built. Now, he, he describes here uh, that, the, the, that the, the fact that this common gospel confession unites every believer across the world. First of all, we are one body. We may be diverse in our backgrounds, our personalities, and our gifts. Wouldn't the church be a boring place if we were all exactly alike? I'll never forget one time. I was at a funeral one, many, many, many years ago. I was pastoring up in West Virginia. And the lady that had passed away had some family that had been involved in a, a new church plant that was happening. It was kind of a charismatic kind of church plant. And that's okay if that's what you, you know, if, if that's what you like. And, uh, and uh, this, this lady came and her husband and they were talking to me. And they're like, oh, our church is so wonderful. Everyone in our church has the spiritual gift of prophecy. That's when you stand up and you speak on behalf of God. And I believe that prophecy has ceased. But anyways, we could, we could debate that. And I said, really? And she said, yes. And I said these words because I, in my past life and occasionally today, am a smart aleck. And I said to her, that must be the most boring church in the world. If you all have the gift of prophecy and you show up and you say, brother, sister, I've got a word from God from you. All they could say was, I know. <laughs> Wasn't it? They knew because they got the same gift you have. What makes the church beautiful is the fact that we're all different. We have different personalities. Last night, we did something as a staff in your name. We were in a trivia contest. We went out to New Hope Baptist Church and it was for our fundraiser for um, Hope Unlimited and we joined together as a staff and, and with the addition of my son Matt to represent you and we came in third. I'm sorry. If we would have listened to Adrian we would have come in second, I think, okay? But we didn't listen to Adrian. Now, let me say this to you very quickly. If Adrian gives you the answer to something, if Adrian speaks, let me ask you this. Adrian's been on staff for three months. How many of you have actually heard him speak? Like, we have, because we've been to lunch with him, and he says, taco salad. He's the quietest guy I know, and he's going to kill me for embarrassing him with this. But when he gave the answer, he was right. Now, here was what made that team fun. We all had different areas of knowledge. Cliff and I were there to be the Bible knowledge guys. They didn't ask a single Bible question. Cliff was a history uh, minor in, in school. My son was a history major. They were our history teachers. Clarissa was our, our everything about redheads and, uh, and, and pop culture. And what made a team, what makes a good trivia team is you're not all experts in the same thing. You all know a little bit of something about different things. Isn't that right? What makes a, a buffet the best kind of restaurant is there's a little of everything, Right? What makes a church beautiful is the fact that God has brought so many different people together from so many different backgrounds, with so many different personalities, with so many different likes and dislikes, strengths and weaknesses, and he's put us all together. If I was up home, I would say into a goulash. Goulash is a Hungarian dish that means throw everything you have in your refrigerator into this. All right? And, it, and it's, it's delicious. It's wonderful. That's what makes the church beautiful. Is we have this unity and diversity. We're one body, we're, but we're united by one spirit. We have a diversity of personalities and, and gifts, but we're united as one church because we have all in, have received one spirit. The Holy Spirit came and, and convicted us of sin, convinced us of the truth of the gospel, sealed us for salvation, guarantees our inheritance. It's, the Holy Spirit unites everyone, and it's the common thread that, that kind of Have you ever been in a church service where all of a sudden you just feel like everybody's on the same wavelength? 
where it seems like everybody, or sometimes in a, in a meeting. I love this when this happens, you know. Uh, sometimes we're as church leaders getting together and, and we're talking about different things and all of a sudden, you know, we'll fall on an idea or a plan or a course of action and it just seems like there's unity around that. This is the Holy Spirit. One hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. Do you notice what he keeps emphasizing? We're united We've been brought together. So a, a, uni- a healthy church is one that is united. A healthy church, the second point, is marked by spiritual diversity. Now, here's what's beautiful. We're all united because we share some things in common, right? We have common salvation, common spirit. We have all these things in common. But then we have this beautiful diversity that I just started talking about. We have different gifts, Look what he says in verse number seven. He says, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he led the host of captives and he gave uh, gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also descended into the lower regions of earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave, look what he says, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Now, what Paul's talking about here is, of course, Jesus ascended and, and, and is announced as Lord, but then he begins to appoint people on earth to, to carry out these different tasks. First of all, he talks there about the fact that, that, that there were some in the church that were designated as apostles. These were people, to be an apostle, you had to be a eyewitness of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so you can imagine, there were 12 original apostles. Judas uh, died, uh, committed suicide. He was replaced by the apostle Paul. Those are the apostles. Now, we don't have apostles today. Okay, they've, that, that, that office is no longer functioning. But notice what he says. Do we also have prophets The prophets were these guys that remember in the very early church, in that first century church, when Paul's writing, they had not completed the New Testament yet. They had the Old Testament. They're still receiving the New Testament. The prophets here are those men who wrote and and declared on behalf of God the things that became eventually the New Testament And it also would go from church to church and to share what God was saying to the churches while the Bible was being completed. That's what a prophet is. Notice what else he says here. The evangelist. What does an evangelist do? An evangelist one is one especially gifted to preach the gospel and to specifically to evangelize new territory. Paul himself is maybe the evangelist par excellence in the New Testament. What Paul do? He'd show up in a city where the gospel had never been preached. He'd find a, a way in. He'd find a, a, you know, a, a place where there was an open door. Perhaps it was the synagogue. Sometimes it was the marketplace. Sometimes it would be a man or, or woman of peace who would kind of open up their door and let Paul preach. And, and what he would do, he was especially gifted of sharing the gospel where the gospel had not been declared before. All right, evangelist. We think of evangelists today. Back in the, and in, in when I was a kid, the, the most preeminent evangelist in the world probably at that time was, was Billy Graham. Spoke to thousands, would go and, and, and preach, uh, you know, in, in major cities, in major crusades, especially gifted for the declaration of the gospel. But then notice what he says also. And these two words go together. The shepherds and teachers. And in, in, the, in the Greek language there, it's, it's, it's shepherd teacher. There's, not, there's no and right there. It's, and it's like he's referring to one role. This is the pastor. The pastor of a church has two basic roles. To shepherd the flock. Do you know what the shepherd primarily did? Fed. <laughs> Healed. Now, not physically healed so much in the sense of a pastor, but spiritual healing and, and helping the church to grow. And also um, correction sometimes. These were things shepherds did. They were, and so he reminds us that we, we have to teach. Notice what he says the goal of all of this is. To equip the saints 
for the work of ministry. Look at that verse. Underline that verse, please. Look what he says. The job of all of these spiritual people, the ultimate job of the pastor, teacher, is to equip the saints for the ministry. Or ministry. That means that you and I and all of us have a ministry to carry out in the church. It's every member of the church carrying out their particular part in the work. You know how a church flourishes? When every member finds their role. Amen? They just do their job, man. They find out what God has gifted them to, what, what he's kind of made them for, shaped and formed them for. Some people are, are just great hospitality people. You know I can't talk about great hospitality people without bringing up Autumn. Autumn's no longer with us. She's in heaven. Amen. She's the greeter in heaven, I think. But he took this very shy, introverted, reclusive personality and once she was saved, made her the face of our church for a year and a half or two years, whatever it was. She had a ministry. And her ministry was just to make people feel welcome. Just greet you when you walked in the door. Some people have a great gift of administration. Alan Rice, our treasurer, keeps the book, you know, helps keep the book straight. He makes these reports. You don't know about this about Coach Rice. Coach is an engineer by training. He helped in the space program for a number of years and built missiles and that kind of stuff. That's how he does. He gives me reports that you have to have a PhD to understand. Now, by the way, I don't know what the PhD is in that you have to have to understand it, but it, it is complicated, but he, he's good at that part. There are other people who are good that are just good servant-hearted people. Everyone, though, has a job. And the church, to be healthy, needs everyone doing their job. Let me say this to you. COVID, in the last two and a half, three years, has affected every church a little bit differently. Let me tell you how it's affected ours. I, I can't speak to how it's affected others, but let me tell you how it affected ours. We stayed really united pretty well. Now, I'm not saying it was perfect. We had some folks that fell off the edges and some folks that didn't like decisions we made. And you know what? God bless you. You don't always have to agree with every decision we make. And sometimes as a church, we make good decisions. Sometimes we make bad decisions. But thank God you stayed with us. And you supported us. And you helped. And we got through that part. But let me tell you where we struggled. We stayed united. We really still were trying to look for how can we do missions and ministry work. And it was limited, very limited compared to what we normally have done. But let me tell you what happened. We got really, really sleepy. Do you know what I mean by that? If you sit around for very long, have you ever noticed it's hard to get up and get moving? We got kind of lethargic, and we just kind of were sitting around going, well, this will be over someday. Now, I don't know. Listen, I'm not making any prediction whether it's over or it's not. Or I don't know what it is, okay? I know this. It's time for church to get back to work. We got missions projects to do. We're going to Chicago this year. Doc and Tam just got back from Moldova just a couple of weeks ago. We got kids or, or young ladies, adults, going off to spend the entire summer in some of our major cities to work with church plants. We got vacation Bible school coming up. We got, we got events planned across the calendar. None of that can happen if we don't have every member serving in their role. So we have to wake up. Now overall, that's been happening, but we gotta keep it up. We gotta keep moving, we gotta keep staying after it. All right, so a healthy church is marked by unity. A healthy church is marked by spiritual diversity. And let me, let me say this final one and, 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 and then give you some points. It's marked by spiritual maturity. Look what he says in verses 13 down to 16. He says that, that the role of the pastor, 
teachers is to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. He says this, we are to keep growing and equipping the church until we reach the full measure of Christ-likeness. That's the goal. The goal is you are going to be like Christ. And every day, in every hour, in every moment, we need to be building towards that, right? We need to be getting a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. I remember when Lou Holtz came and took over the football team at Notre Dame. And uh, it was like his second season that he had been in there. And, you know, those expectations at Notre Dame are always pretty high uh, for the football coach. And he inherited a pretty bad team. And, and the first year wasn't so good. And the second year, they were a little bit better. And they asked him... How is your team doing? And I love this quote. You've probably heard me say it before. So what, this is what, this is what uh, a Coach Holt said. He said, we're not where we want to be, and we're not what we ought to be, but thank God we're not what we used to be. <laughs> what he meant was, we're not quite where we need to be yet. Where we need to be is national championship caliber. That's the goal. That's the play. And we're not there yet. But we're not where we started from. We're getting a little bit better all the time. That is a Beatles quote for those of you that were wondering. We're getting a little bit better. We're growing in our faith. We're growing in our walk. The goal is to become more like Jesus. He reminds us here that a healthy church is marked, and let me say this, by a growing spiritual maturity. We're never going to be perfect. We haven't reached it yet. No church has ever reached it perfectly this side of heaven. But he says we're to grow. And how do you grow? Well, you grow by becoming more like Jesus, in verse 13, towards Christ-likeness. Doctrinal stability, verse 14. Relational accountability in verses 15 and 16. He says, we are to be growing more like Jesus. And all of ultimately, in verse 16, he says the maturity is marked by the fact that we're making a contribution to the whole body. So are we a healthy church? Let me ask you a better question. Are you... A healthy church member. The question is not really, are we a healthy church? Because let me say this to you. Every church is only as strong as its weakest member. Hey, we've been talking about that, Cliff. As it relates to the Southern Baptist Convention. A handful of knuckleheads can bring down the whole organization, right? We all know that. You have one guy on a team. You have a basketball team out there playing basketball. And by the way, I don't know anything about basketball. So just, you know. And and, and if you have four guys out there just giving it everything they got, but the point guard is just kind of standing around doing this. Are you going to win a basketball game? No. You got to have every part doing this job. You got to have every part contributing. You got to have every part healthy doing its job. So let me ask you this. Are you pursuing your call? Are you living a godly lifestyle? Are you actively using your gifts in the service of the church and striving towards maturity? Listen, if you can't answer yes to all three of those questions, you need to get to the altar. And let me just be frank. Anyone who answers yes to all three questions needs to go back and read that verse on humility again. The reality is none of us meet this. It's an ongoing, everyday process. One of my favorite things that I saw in seminary, in fact, it might be the most important thing I ever learned in seminary. I was sitting in the lunchroom one day over at Liberty University 
And they, had a, they have a marvelous lunchroom. If you're looking for a college and you grade it like I would on the lunchroom, that's where you want to go. Great lunchroom. They got a Chick-fil-A built into it, man. All right? It's, it's, and I was sitting there, and the na- table next to me were two guys that you probably won't recognize the names, but were legends in Christianity in the 1970s and 80s. Elmer Towns and Harold Wilmington. Two of the biggest Bible scholars in the institution. We all took classes from them. These are the guys that wrote all the books. And they were sitting there talking about the Bible. Not to prepare for a class. They were just talking about what they had read. As as brothers in Christ, they had joined together and were reading the Bible together. And, and, and a couple of times a week, they would get together for lunch and they would just talk about what they were learning. They were forming an accountability group. And they were just sharing. And, and Elmer would say, I was reading this verse and I never thought about it. But, but did you notice it says this? And Wilmington would say, no, I never noticed that. These guys had forgotten more about the Bible than I will ever know. They were both in their 70s and they were still working hard to reach spiritual maturity. That's what we need to be. Amen? That's what we need to be. All right. Ask yourself those three questions. Am I living out my call? Am I pursuing a Christ-like character? Am I on mission? If you not say yes to all three of those questions, the altar will be open. If you say, you know what, pastor, now I know what a church is supposed to be like. I need to be a member of that church. I need to join that church. Come, join our church. Maybe you're here today and you say, pastor, I recognize something today. I'm not sure that I've ever been born again. I'm not sure that I've ever had a moment where I've repented of my sins and placed my trust in Jesus. Come, get that settled. That's the most important thing you'll settle. Amen.